Hello and welcome to the program today. I'm Layo. Olari Day will begin in Ethiopia, where fighting has flared up in one of the disputed areas between Ethiopia's Tigray and Amhara regions. Now, this is a rare episode of violence, especially after a peace accord that was signed in late 2022, ending one of Africa's deadliest wars. Raya Alamata district is both claimed uh, by both regions and had been under southern Tigray before war broke out, but has since been seized by Amhara forces. Residents say that fighting began over the weekend and has continued for days. Amhara officials accuse fighters aligned with the Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLF, of launching offensives, while the head of southern Tigray says Amhara militiamen opened fire. The Ethiopian federal government has recently said that the army would control disputed areas until a resolution is made. There are concerns that this could further complicate the conflict that has been raging since August last year in Amhara. That's Ethiopia's second most populous region between the local militia and the army. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says he will not relent in his calls for all parties to silence the guns and meet the aspirations of the Sudanese people for a peaceful and secure future. Mr. Guterres was speaking to reporters in New York even as Sudan marks Today, one year since the start of fighting milestone. between the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support the forces. He it says it's a heartbreaking rapid. milestone. And this is more than a conflict between Today marks a heartbreaking milestone, one year since the start of fighting between the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces. And this is more than a conflict between two warring parties. It is a war being waged on the Sudanese people. It is a war on the many thousands of civilians who have been killed and tens of thousands maimed for life. It is a war on the 18 million people facing acute hunger and the communities now standing down the terrifying threat of famine in the months ahead. It's a war on villages, homes, hospitals, schools and vital systems that have been reduced to rubble in conflict hotspots. And it is a war on human rights and international humanitarian law. And let me be clear, any attack on El Fasher will be devastating for civilians and could lead to a full-blown intercommunal conflict across Darfur. It would also upend aid operations in an area already on the brink of famine, since El Fasher has always been a critical UN humanitarian hub. All parties must facilitate the safe, rapid and unimpeded passage of humanitarian personnel and supplies through all available routes into El Fasher. And this includes the timely approval of convoys and avoiding any measures that could delay or otherwise obstruct humanitarian movements. We must do all we can to ensure maximum humanitarian assistance in Darfur and elsewhere. The 2.7 billion humanitarian response plan for Sudan was only 6% funded before the conference. And the 1.4 billion regional refugee response plan for the Sudan crisis only 7%. And as a result of the war, millions of people have been forced to flee in search of safety and humanitarian assistance, causing one of the largest and most challenging humanitarian and displacement crises in the world. In South Sudan, about 1,800 people are still arriving every day from Sudan, increasing pressure on overstretched infrastructure and exacerbating the vast humanitarian needs in the country. Kelly Clements, the UNHCR's Deputy High Commissioner, visited the country, recently meeting with Sudanese refugees as well as returnees who spoke about the challenges they faced escaping conflict at home. I'm in Rank uh, in South Sudan. This is a place that has seen 530,000 people come through the border from Sudan and over 635,000 people in total, new arrivals to this country after war broke out a year ago. 
This is a community that has welcomed refugees from Sudan, but also welcomed those South Sudanese returning to their country after many, many years away. We, UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, and partners are working around the clock to try to provide assistance to those new arrivals, those returnees, those refugees, trying to ensure that the host community here can support the many pressures that are upon them. But this is an aid effort that needs to continue, and we need to be looking at this effort as not just one of emergency response, but thinking about solutions already. Where can people go where they can start rebuilding their lives? They can start taking care of their families that have been just through traumatic incidents. But until we see peace in Sudan, we will be here in South Sudan to be able to support this country, its people, and importantly, the returnees and the refugees that depend on them for protection and aid. Well, one year since violence exploded in Sudan, and as the ensuing crisis continues to deepen the lives, educations, and futures of a generation of South Sudanese children hang in the balance. Now, beyond the direct impact of the violence on children, the UN Children's Agency, UNICEF, says the ongoing war has fueled a lethal combination of displacement, disease outbreaks, and hunger. Sudan now has one of the worst education crises in the world, with more than 90% of the country's 19 million school-aged children having no access to formal education. The ongoing disruption to education, UNICEF says, will result in a generational crisis for Sudan. To politics now in South Africa, the face of South African politics has transformed in the three decades of the country's democracy, with opposition political parties and new smaller parties determined to leave a dent in the ruling party's ANC's historic popularity. As South Africa marks 43 days until the 29th of May elections, our South African Correspondent in the sense Samosa spoke with potential voters in Pretoria. Every other five years, citizens are promised better life and prosperity. It's getting closer and closer. May this year, South Africans are going to the polls. We took it to the streets of Pretoria to find out the preparedness of citizens to the elections. And this is the vision citizens have for the post-election period. After vote, we are facing unemployment, and our children are struggling to find employment opportunities as well. While we receive some financial assistance from government grants, it's inadequate because we also need to support our unemployed children. They rely on us for assistance. I'm from Maminodine, so there's no roads. Uh, when I say roads, I mean tar roads. We don't have tar roads, there's no bridges, and there's kids who go to school across say, the, the river sometimes, you understand? So it's difficult for them. As we, as black, we voted, uh, we want to, want people to, want councillors to improve our, that place. Um, obviously change, um, more people getting employed, especially young people, because there's a lot of unemployment for young people. So that's what I want to see. And just the environment as well. Yeah, we want our next generation to actually as well live in a better South Africa. Some young people are telling me that South Africa's national elections will not result in significant policy changes as the ruling ANC will remain the dominant political force and its reform agenda will remain in place. Are you going to vote? I'm not going to vote. Why, why? I don't have a reason why. So you're just, you're not interested? I'm not interested. Because you feel like they're not doing what they're supposed to ah, do? Yeah. Oh. They're full of lies, you see. Oh. Uh -huh. But maybe your, your vote can make a difference. <laughs> There's no difference. Because uh -huh. voting or non-voting uh, is still the same. As we approach the elections, it's evident that South Africa's political landscape is in flux, with voters actively considering their options. From Pretoria, South Africa, 
Innocent Samosa, Channels Television News. Police in Namibia have launched a massive manhunt for 11 prisoners who are said to have escaped from a police cell in northeastern Zambezi region. Local media reports that the escapees are awaiting trial, that they cut through the roof of the Katima Mulilo police station before escaping. Police say pieces of blades and ropes made out of blankets. The items suspected to have been used in the jailbreak were found in the cell. Locals are now being warned to be vigilant as the escapees are awaiting trial for serious crimes and one of them is a notorious repeat offender. Residents have also been urged to report any suspicious activities or groups of people to the police. More than one ton of cocaine has been intercepted by customs authorities in Senegal. This is the biggest inland haul of the drug ever made in the country. A lorry carrying 1,137 kilograms of cocaine was intercepted in the eastern town of Kidira, which is near the border with Mali. The drug had been concealed in packets and placed in bags at the bottom of the lorry, which had arrived from a neighboring country that authorities didn't name. According to them, the consignment is valued at 90 billion CFA francs. Large drug hauls have become more common in Senegal. Last November, the Navy sees three tons of cocaine from a ship off the country's coast, marking one of the Navy's largest drug hauls. The region is a transit point for Latin American cartels trafficking drugs to Europe and elsewhere. The chairman and CEO of National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, Brigadier General Buba Mawa, says the United Kingdom is a steadfast ally in efforts to neutralize transnational criminal activities, particularly in the realm of illicit drug production and trafficking. Uh, Brigadier General Mara stated this while delivering his speech during the commissioning of a new building at the Special Area Command Muritala Mohammed International Airport, Nako Ikeja. The NDLEA boss said the project was made possible through the generous support of the British government, thanking them for their unwavering support and commitment to the NDLEA's course. He says the project will serve as a vital hub for data analysis and strategic uh, planning in the agency's efforts to disrupt drug trafficking networks and also apprehend those responsible. Well, the British Deputy High Commissioner, while giving his remarks, said they are absolutely delighted in supporting the NDLEA and the Nigerian government to what has become a global industry which requires a global response that needs partners to work together. I must begin by expressing our deepest gratitude to the British government for their unwavering commitment and invaluable contributions to our cause. From the onset of our collaboration, the UK has been a steadfast ally in our relentless pursuit to neutralize transnational organized criminal activities, particularly in the realm of illicit drug production and trafficking. The significance of this project cannot be overstated. It will serve as a vital hub for data analysis and strategic planning in our efforts to disrupt drug trafficking networks and apprehend those responsible. With state-of-the-art facilities and technology at our disposal, we are better equipped than ever before to tackle this complex an ever-evolving challenge head on. We are absolutely delighted to be supporting this office, but we're absolutely delighted to be continuing our support to the NDLA and to the Nigerian government to tackle what is sadly a global industry. And a global industry needs a global response and needs governments and partners to work together is hosting a regional conference on boosting girls' education in East Africa. The goal is to challenge societal norms that exclude some girls from mainstream education by using culturally sensitive approaches. Over 100 stakeholders from Uganda, Tanzania and Kenya are partaking in the three-day meeting 
which kicked off in Nairobi. Another key focus is boosting support systems for vulnerable girls, including pregnant girls, teenage mothers, and girls with disabilities. Now, against the backdrop of the 10th anniversary of the Chibok School abduction, UNICEF is asking for intensified efforts to protect the country's most vulnerable population, the children. In backing up this call, UNICEF released the Minimum Standards for Safe Schools Monitoring Report, which reveals a stark reality that the journey toward ensuring every Nigerian child can learn in a safe environment is far from over. Most notably, the report shows that just 37% of schools across 10 states have early warning systems in place to identify threats such as school attacks. With the kidnapping of the Chibok girls serving as a wake-up call to the severe risks, of risks children face in the pursuit of education, UNICEF is collaborating with stakeholders from Jigawa, Kano and Katsina states in Nigeria to keep the schooling environment safe. UNICEF Senior Education Manager in Kano, Michael Banda, outlined some of these impacts at an event in the state to draw attention to the issues. Ten years ago, there has been an increase on the number of attacks on schools. And um, these attacks have resulted into um, many children being out of school for obvious reasons. Children feel insecure to go to school. Parents feel insecure to send their children to school. So this has resulted into a number of children. You are aware that about 18 million children uh, in Nigeria are out of school for primary and junior secondary school. It's a big commemoration so that we governize the community efforts, we governize the government efforts, schools, learners, parents come together. This is the only sure security we are going to have to safeguard our children in schools. When we have that community school compact, where we have the whistleblowers freely to blow the whistle and say they are aliens in our community that we do not need, that are planning, that are intending to attack our schools. Once that fabric is very strong, we will not need the war fences. Well, still in Nigeria, food vendors and small business owners in Kajuna State are appealing to the government to establish a stable market where they can buy food items at regulated prices, as well as provide regular electricity supply to them and other for them to remain in business. They spoke at a three-day food festival organized by the Kaduna State Marketing Company, an event which drew over 1,000 food vendors and culinary enthusiasts in attendance. In a world that is rapidly changing, events such as the Kaduna Food Festival and Exhibition provides a platform for local producers, chefs and culinary enthusiasts to not only showcase their skills and products, but also contribute to the economic growth of the state. The governor, who was represented by the executive chairman of the Kaduna State Internal Revenue Service, Mr. Jerry Adams, describes the fair as an enabler to promoting sustainable economic development and peaceful coexistence. We are going to be providing each and every one of you with tax identification numbers. That is thin, free of charge. If any support is coming from the form of grant or any other thing, you are going to be asked for your thing. I think it's a beautiful thing. It's very, very impressive to see, you know, different things. You might have seen it before now, but with this, you are able to know what is, um, what meal represents what culture. You know, people that are not in the north always tag everybody in the north as houses, but you find out that in Kaduna, you have Kataf, you have Baju, outside the, the, the core houses, there are still other tribes that make up the north. Some of the food exhibitors commend the Kaduna State Government for organizing the food festival, but want a stable market for affordable food prices and constant electricity supply that will support activities of the food value chain. 
I think the major challenge we are facing currently with our business, most small business owners, number one is the hike in prices of, of food and every other materials that we require for our business. Number two, lack of electricity. I'm very proud of Cardona State for putting this thing together. I'm proud of the organizers. What I see here is something that's going to bring unity to the, to the citizens and the people of Cardona State. It's a very, very wonderful concept, bringing everybody that cooks together. Wow. For a state that has been plagued by lingering insecurity, the state government believes that the food goes beyond mere economic gains, considering its significant role in promoting sustainable peace. For people to be able to gather like this, it shows that there's peace in Kaduna. It also shows that there's peaceful coexistence between people of Kaduna state, not minding where they come from, not minding their religion or ethnic background. This is thanks to the governor of Kaduna State, His Excellency Senator Basani, for ensuring that peace has returned fully to Kaduna State for, for us to be able to have an event of this magnitude. Over 1,000 participants display the rich culinary heritage of Kaduna State and beyond, as well as many other attractions like games and dancing competitions by children, all geared towards promoting unity and peace. Let's head over to the United Arab Emirates, where 14-year-old Nigerian artist Kanye Tagwo Okeke showcases 20 captivating artworks as part of his solo exhibition in Dubai. Hosted by Dubai's first autism-friendly certified hotel and supported by government agencies, the exhibition celebrates Kanye's talent while sending a message as part of this year's Autism Awareness Month. Our correspondent, Mayowa Adegoke, has more. 20 paintings by 14-year-old Nigerian artist Kanye Tagbo Keke on display at his solo exhibition in Dubai. We do this for two reasons. Yes, we want to showcase Kanye's art. But then more than that, we have this passion for letting the world know that children living with autism need to be cared for as well. Uh, and need to be taken really, really very seriously because of the gift which they carry, which we do believe is a really huge gift. Every child living with special needs. And so every time the, the end of, at the end of one um, exhibition, my wife starts to look for the next place where we can go. We, 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 the passion is such that we want to go all around the world and let the world know what we, the gift that we have and how other parents and other caregivers can also be able to um, harness their own gift as well. Hosted by Dubai's first autism-friendly certified hotel, as well as other Dubai government agencies, the exhibition titled FAT is Kanye's way of letting the world know he's fabulous, autistic and talented. So having Kanye and having Dubai Autism Center incorporated with the Ace Dubai shows a lot of importance and highlighting the importance of family is the key to support children with autism. But with family, we mean parents, then we mean uh, siblings, relatives, and the small circle, and then we go outside to the larger community and the society itself. Dubai is playing a huge role by being an uh, autism a friendly city and being very much inclusive to all, to everyone. Today with his brilliance as 14, what he shows us is the light of Nigeria and for all Africa. He's the prototype role model of kids, which are really we are proud of. Also present are representatives from the Nigerian and Canadian High Commissions in the United Arab Emirates. Kanye's paintings are created to raise awareness that no autistic child should be left behind. All the artworks, they are not, you can't say they follow the same idea, but you know they are Kanye's works because of the way it's structured. Um, because Kanye doesn't paint 
it's not like an artist, okay, I'm going to plan this, I'm going, this is the series I'm going to do, I'm going to investigate. Kanye paints from his heart. Whatever he's feeling, however he's feeling it, he paints it. He doesn't care if somebody likes it or not. His own is, I feel this and I just want to put it on canvas. So what you see, it has its DNA, but they are all different, with different expressions of Kanye. Kanye, who started creating at age two and made his first painting at age five, now has his artworks as merchandise, including t-shirts and mugs. From Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, Maya Wadegoki for Channel's Television News. Just beautiful. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olaundi.